welcome everyone. It's uh, my uh, pride to get to actually uh, welcome you all uh, to this year's uh, Faces of Lung Cancer Briefing for 2023. Thank every single one of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and hear uh, what we have to say today about our update about how lung cancer is affecting all of us across this country. My name is Dr. Rosalind Jurgens. I'm a medical oncologist at the Juravinsky Cancer Center in Hamilton, Ontario. And one of my favorite hats that I wear is the medical advisory chair of Lung Cancer Canada. I will be your master of ceremonies today. I would like to thank all of our sponsors of today's event. Um, there have been so many people who have uh, supported us all throughout the year, uh, especially in acknowledgement of it being Lung Cancer Awareness Month in November. I know we've only got a handful of days, and I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't remind all of you that today is Giving Tuesday. So hopefully you're keeping Lung Cancer Canada front of mind as uh, you're making your charitable donations uh, this year. So as I mentioned, uh, this event is the official launch of our 2023 Faces of Lung Cancer report. It is available on the Lung Cancer Canada website. Uh, and that uh, link we will be pasting into the chat. Uh, there it is right there, so that if you would like to read it in greater detail, uh, you'll be able to, to access the report. I will say it has been a very busy 2023 for Lung Cancer Canada. We have had some really amazing events uh, that have uh, been peppered throughout the entire year. Uh, we uh, were featured at a New York Islanders hockey game. Uh, it was uh, amazing to get to see some of our uh, Lung Cancer Canada folks literally up on the Jumbotron. This was an event to honor uh, a hockey legend, Mike Bossy, uh, and they have created uh, uh, a, a fund to be able to help support uh, lung cancer and its diagnosis. We had a Give a Breath 5K national walk run. It was actually conducted in three cities across the country. It was in Vancouver, Edmonton, and Toronto. We went back to an actual in-person evening of hope. So we had a hybrid evening of hope this year. Um, and so it was nice to have folks be able to come back and join in person as well as virtually so that we could celebrate Lung Cancer Awareness Month. We have been doing advocacy receptions at both Queens Park and on Parliament Hill. We've also gone back to in-person lung cancer summits, and we've actually had summits that have graced the entire country. There have been events in Edmonton, Vancouver. We've reached out to Northern Ontario, and there was events in both Sudbury and Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, and there's more events that are coming in early 2024. So last but not least, we couldn't do all the work that we do if we didn't have uh, not only fundraising, uh, but support from our sponsors. So today's uh, lung cancer briefing uh, is being sponsored by a multitude of uh, groups, uh, but I would like to thank Roche Canada, Merck, Pfizer, Sanofi, AstraZeneca, Janssen, Bristol Myers Squibb, Eli Lilly, EMD Serono, Gilead, and Bayer. Thanks to each of these uh, companies for providing uh, their support. Uh, we use these dollars to help patients uh, across this country, um, and uh, every bit uh, goes to, to wonderful endeavors. So let's move on to the beginning of our, our agenda. Um, I'm going to be introducing a, a colleague of mine and, and honestly, a, a friend. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephanie Snow. Dr. Snow has been the president of Lung Cancer Canada since 2021. She is a medical oncologist at the QE2 Health Sciences Center in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where she's been working since 2010. She is a full professor at the Faculty of Medicine at Dalhousie, 
and she treats both thoracic and GI malignancies, and as you can imagine, has a passion for lung cancer advocacy. So thank you, Dr. Snow, for providing us updates on immunotherapy and the management of lung cancer. Thank you, Rosin. Again, I'd like to welcome and thank everybody for joining us today. So uh, when you do get a chance to take a look at our Faces of Lung Cancer report for 2023, you'll see we do have some sections highlighting some of those areas in which we've really made a lot of growth and moved forward um, in lung cancer in Canada and globally. So um, if you want to move the slides perhaps to the first one there that has the uh, Canadian statistics, great. So literally just a few weeks ago, we saw the publication of the 2023 Canadian Cancer Statistics, which came out from the Canadian Cancer Society. And we saw some really great news for lung cancer, things that as clinicians we had had a sense of, but here we have the nitty gritty details that lung cancer's reduction in mortality has been the most profound improvement of any type of cancer in Canada over a broad time period from 1984 to 2000. And so here we see the graphs that showed us that. The blue graph is that for Canadian males and the green graph is that for Canadian females. And we see that the reduction in mortality over this time period was 4.3% for males and just a little bit less for women at 4.1%. Now, that being said, we still have a long way to go. Unfortunately, lung cancer does still remain the number one cause of cancer mortality among Canadians. But this just goes to show that all of our work, our research has truly led to improved outcomes. Now, we're going to hear a little bit later from Dr. Finley about how lung cancer screening may continue to improve this. But one of the things that's changed over this time period are the development and access to some very uh, successful therapies for our lung cancer patients, both those who are living with an incurable diagnosis of lung cancer, but also to increase cure rates. One of those major changes has been the introduction of immunotherapy drugs. So for those of you not uh, is quite as familiar with immunotherapy drugs. They are, are intravenous therapies, but as opposed to directly targeting a cancer cell and killing it the way that, for instance, a chemotherapy drug would, the immunotherapy drug works to allow the immune system, our own body's innate immune system, to kill cancer cells using our own white blood cells. And sometimes it can lift the foot off the brake, allowing the immune system to be more active and thereby go and kill cancer cells that otherwise it would have been suppressed from doing. And sometimes it stimulates an immune response, almost like when you go to get your flu shot or your COVID shot um, and allowing a whole new army of white blood cells to appear. And what we found is really over the past 10 years or so that we've had access in a readily uh, fashion, and it's been approved for funding in Canada, we've seen some great success stories. So we're going to talk a little bit about where we are with that immunotherapy story today. Next slide. So of of course, the first patients that were treated with immunotherapy were those with advanced disease. And we saw in our evening of hope, a celebration that came out of Alberta, where they were celebrating one patient's 10-year anniversary since first receiving his immunotherapy drug on a trial. And he had had a 10-year survival, not on therapy and no sign of cancer at present. And so this really has moved forward that so if a patient is diagnosed with an advanced disease that does not have a mutation found on molecular testing for which they could receive an oral therapy, that immunotherapy has now pushed chemotherapy away and it's become the backbone of our treatment. So for every new patient that Roz or I might see in our clinics or seen anywhere in the country, we do talk immunotherapy as the backbone of treatment. And then the question is, does this patient, will they do better if we add chemotherapy? Or do they actually have characteristics in their cancer that would suggest that a single agent immunotherapy will be enough for them? And this is also really great for those patients, approximately one third who would qualify for single agent immunotherapy, because we also know that on the whole, immunotherapy is much less toxic than chemotherapy. So it's a win-win if it works better and it's less toxic. 
And those very first trials looking at outcomes for patients treated with immunotherapy, we're now confident in saying because we've got at least five years, four years, six years of follow-up, that adding immunotherapy in advanced incurable disease has now reduced the risk of death for patients upwards of 25 to 40% compared to chemotherapy alone. And this is not just non-small cell lung cancer, but also for small cell lung cancer. So truly across the breadth of our patients with lung cancer. Next slide. So the first indication that we saw for immune therapy in helping to cure patients were those who have stage three disease. So the cancer has not left their chest. Unfortunately, it is too advanced that a surgeon would not be able to do a safe operation to remove all that cancer. So that's what we call unresectable stage three disease. And our standard of care, given with curative intent, aiming to cure the patient and get rid of that cancer once and for all, has for a long time been chemo radiation. But now for several years, we've had evidence and have had access to providing those patients who have their chemo radiation, when they have their restaging CAT scan, there's no sign of their disease having progressed to introduce a year of an immunotherapy treatment called Drivalumab. And we know from long-term results with that trial that this appears to increase the cure rates by 10%. So an extra one in 10 patients is actually alive and cancer-free long-term because they were able to receive that immunotherapy. Next slide. So what's really been new in the past year and what we've been getting our feet wet as medical oncologists, but also as the full multidisciplinary team involved in the treatment of lung cancer has been the introduction of immunotherapy now in the curative intent setting for those patients with even earlier stage where their disease is appropriate for resection. And so we've looked at all kinds of different ways of introducing immunotherapy. Traditionally, patients are sent directly to the operating room. They have their cancer resected. And if they even have um, uh, lymph nodes involved or if their tumor is generally bigger than four centimeters, we would typically see them as a medical oncologist and talk about some adjuvant chemotherapy, which has been shown to improve cure rates. We've known that for quite a long time. So our new strategies can be broken into three categories. Neoadjuvant means moving therapy before the surgery as opposed to after. And this was the first strategy that we had availability to use in Canada with just three cycles of chemotherapy and an immunotherapy drug called nivolumab. We do know that receiving that treatment followed by surgery has been related to significant reduction in the types of events that we don't want to see after surgery, such as recurrence. And we don't have quite mature data there yet to say that it's helping people live longer, but we've seen some very, very good signals that that will be the case with more mature data. On the other hand, we also now have access and there's evidence to adding immunotherapy in that adjuvant setting. So there are still some patients for whom it's most appropriate to proceed directly with a surgery as opposed to doing treatment up front. And we now have evidence and access to therapies that after the chemotherapy has been given, they can use uh, one drug called atezolizumab, especially uh, a subset that has a high level of protein called PDL1. And while we don't yet have formal approval, we can give all patients in Canada a drug in the same setting called pembrolizumab through an access program. So that's another option that Canadian patients are receiving today. Finally, there's the perioperative approach. And in the perioperative approach, we said, well, we can give some neoadjuvant, we can give some adjuvant too. It almost becomes a sandwich around chemotherapy. So typically in the trials that we've seen read out, there's been three major trials that we've already seen. Patients will receive some chemotherapy and immunotherapy up front, very similar to what we've seen in the neoadjuvant setting. Then they have their surgery. And then after surgery, they can receive the immunotherapy for upwards of a year afterwards. We've seen three positive trials read out in the past year. It's been incredibly exciting. One with a drug called pembrolizumab, one with nivolumab, and one with dervalumab. We don't yet have access, but I expect it will not be a long time until we do. And the most exciting thing was that at our recent meeting, one of our Canadian surgeons, Dr. Jonathan Spicer from Montreal, was able to report for the first time a survival benefit that was shown for this perioperative approach so that patients are living longer. And also, we already have the data that patients are living longer with the adjuvant approach. So what we have here are three great new options on the table for a large number of our patients who 
who are considered appropriate for surgery. So if you'd like some more details, please read that section in the Lung Cancer Canada book. But this is really, I think, one of those driving forces that hopefully the next time we check similar data from the Canadian Cancer Society, we're going to see that reduction in mortality and improved outcomes to be marching ever forward. Thanks a whole lot. Thank you very much, Stephanie. That was a fantastic overview and so much hope from uh, all the different things that we're seeing, including impacting those pesky statistics. Um, that is one of the, the things that we've had uh, the most difficult time doing and to see improvements in uh, those Canadian statistics really uh, brought me joy. Uh, so thank you for that uh, time today. So our next speaker is again a friend and colleague. This is Dr. Christian Finley. Uh, Dr. Finley is a thoracic surgeon here in Hamilton. He practices at our St. Joseph's Hospital here. Uh, he is a professor of surgery at McMaster University. He's an international leader and he works with the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. He's the lung cancer lead for the International Benchmarking Partnership. He's an advisor on lung cancer screening for the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Health and Care, and he's the clinical lead for the Ontario Lung Cancer Screening Program. Um, beyond that, he's also an amazing uh, father, friend, uh, and colleague. So thank you so much, Christian, for dedicating your time to us today. Thanks so much, Roz. Can you guys hear me okay? Roz, can you hear me okay? Yep. Nope. You're perfect. Perfect. Okay. So... I have the unenviable task of talking to you all um, about uh, lung cancer screening and trying to, to, to pack it all in in 10 minutes. So what I would say is for anybody that has further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out because this is a subject that I'm quite passionate about. Next slide, please. So lung cancer screening has been um, been shown to reduce mortality by about 25 percent. And there's there's almost no intervention I can think of in cancer that has such a profound impact. And this uh, um, are three pictures. This is my grandfather, my father, and I. And, and my grandfather was a thoracic surgeon, my dad's a thoracic surgeon, and I'm a thoracic surgeon. And it's interesting to go back to my grandfather's notes to see what lung cancer was like in the 1940s and 50s in Canada, to have lived you know, with my father and, and seen his practice, and then to, to see mine today, because it's just been transformative about what we've experienced uh, in lung cancer and, and the therapies that we can bring to bear. Next slide, please. So. I'm going to go through a bit of background, some of the evidence of value of lung cancer screening, talk about how we set up a program, how we build that capacity and infrastructure, and ultimately where we're at in Canada. Uh, next slide. So when you take it, when you zoom out and look at lung cancer uh, internationally, it's, it's responsible for the most cancer deaths in the world, about 2 million. And certainly in the Canadian context, there's about 30,000 cases of Canada a, a year, and about 21,000 people die from that. And that's really responsible for more deaths than breast, prostate, and colon combined. And those are the next three most common cancers. And so really, um, while lung cancer is responsible for 25% of the mortality, it gets about 5% of the funding. And I think that we're all here today uh, as testament to that we need to change that. So but when we identify lung cancer at an early stage, it's very curable, whether that's by surgery or radiation. Um, and really, I think in the, in the lung cancer community, it's a time of great optimism, whether it's lung cancer screening or different therapies, that, that we really think that we can continue to bend this curve. And when we did that publication that came out uh, from the Canadian Cancer Society a couple of weeks ago, you know, I think that was really a, a call to arms that we're seeing that bend in the curve. Next slide. So um, this really is just a, a, a survival curve that's showing that along the bottom is the stage and on the uh, y-axis is survival. And just to say that if you find cancer at an early stage, it's highly curable. And that as you get a higher and higher stage, it's less curable. And that's how things typically show up in this day and age is with more advanced stage disease. And we need to pull it back and, and uh, find patients at an earlier stage. Next slide. And so when we look at the World Health Organization, they, they've really put a call to uh, call to action, really trying to reduce global mortality for non-communicable diseases by about 30%. And from um, a lung cancer, it has really got to be uh, foremost for that uh, in the cancer realm. Next slide. So when we when we drew out a, a strategy on how we would accomplish this in Canada, that orange bar you see to, to reduce that mortality by 30% really has to be optimal lung cancer screening. That is is the workhorse of reducing mortality for lung cancer. And, and something that we need to, to make sure lands across the country and in, a, in an accessible standpoint. Next slide. 
So uh, why do we screen? Well, we, we want to screen for people if we can detect it at an earlier stage and we and we know there's a high risk factor that we can target. And whether that's uh, colorectal cancer or cervical cancer, or in this case, lung cancer, we know that smoking causes lung cancer. And so we know who that ho those high risk people are. And so that it meets the criteria for lung cancer for screening. Next slide. So where did it start from? Well, if we go back all the way to the 1970s when my grandfather was practicing, uh, they thought that chest x-rays might provide a good screening test. Uh, next slide. And what we really found was it didn't. That, that giving a person a chest x-ray every year does not identify it at earlier stage disease and provides no advantage. Uh, next slide. But what happened thereafter is we found CT scans that came on board. So this would be my father's era. Um, and we were able to identify lesions at a small size. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, this New England Journal article came out showing we're able to um, look to see if CT scans were effective. This wasn't a randomized trial. These weren't the, that proved that lung cancer screening worked. This was saying, can CT scans find cancers at earlier stage? And do they have good survival? Next slide. And so you can see here, I'm sure a lot of you aren't accustomed to looking at these slides, but that orange line on the top is, is when you found earlier stage disease and you resected it, you were able to cure 92% of people. Next slide. And so coming into to my era, um, really the NLST was the first international trial to show survival advantage for screening for lung cancer. Next slide. And what they did is they did a CT scan for anybody 55 to 74 who smoked 30 pack years, and they gave them an annual scan for three years. And they followed people out and looked at their mortality. Next slide. And really what they showed is that they improved survival by about 25%. And so this was the first big trial that says lung cancer screening. Uh, was advantage, but this came out almost 10 years ago or over 10 years ago. And so I think that that we really wanted to see a faster turnaround than we have and it speaks to the difficulty in implementation. Next slide. And, and thankfully, we also have a, a, another supporting trial that published in 2020 called the Nelson trial. Next slide. And this is really coming out of Europe that showed the exact same thing. They, they did a slightly different way of enrolling people. They evaluated nodules in a slightly different way, but ultimately they did CT scans at year one, three, and five and a half. Next slide. And really what it showed is that, again, it had a 24% improvement in um, mortality for smoking. Next slide. So that leads us to every or national organization came out with, with recommendations that said we need to be doing lung, uh, screening for lung cancer. And you can see these are 2012, 2013, and still, you know, with some really concerted effort from, from you know, Lung Cancer Canada, Canadian Cancer Society, and, and Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, we're starting to see that land now where, where as I'll speak to in a moment. Um, next slide. Um, we, we have the ability to, to get lung cancer screening uh, systematically in, in two provinces and, and have pilots with an intention to get programs uh, in most of the rest. One of the one of the, the big pushbacks against lung cancer screening was, was that it costs a lot of money, but it's certainly more cost effective than breast screening, and really um, is highly cost effective, in particular when you include smoking cessation. Next slide. And so this is the slide that really looks in Canada. So BC has province-wide um, program for smoke, for lung cancer screening. Ontario has um, four sites, soon to be five, with an intention to expand across the province. And then most of the other sites, Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, Quebec, we have pilots and, and CPAC is funding these to expand um, to deliver uh, lung cancer screening. And the hope is really that by tipping all these sites, we're going to have this programmatically across the country. But I think that that is something that we need to keep pushing for. Next slide. So when it comes to implementing a program, um, you know, how we design that is important. And so it really speaks to how we recruit people, how we identify if they're eligible. Um, navigate them through the process so they don't get lost. Make sure that the images that we're taking are of good quality and the people interpreting them are systematic in that. And then really taking that and, and flowing the people that need to out the other side and to be assessed for lung cancer. Next slide. So from a recruitment standpoint, you just want to make sure that we find people who are at high risk. And, and I think that's one of the, the, the challenges and one of the tragedies of lung cancer is that because people are socially disadvantaged or socially stigmatized, they don't step up for this. And even when we have lung cancer screening, people don't participate, not the least of which those uh, from equity deserving populations. So I think that, you know, in, in some areas of the United States where they have lung cancer screening, they only have five to 15% of, of eligible people participating. And so I think that when, when and where we have this available, we really need to put in that effort to recruit those people. Next slide. And when it comes to communication, well, again, this is a, a common area where people get lost, making sure that they get those letters, that you have follow-up phone calls, that you, you are consistent in how we communicate so people understand, you know, should they be worried? Because it's, it's there's a lot of anxiety around this. Next slide. 
And so how do we risk assess people? Well, looking at uh, next slide, when we look at, at, at the NLST and the Nelson trial, they really just took a very simple model and said, how old are you? How much did you smoke? And if it crossed the line when they en en enrolled people, but we realized that that our age limit should probably be bigger. And certainly from the U.S. Preventative Task Force expanded to it for 50 to 80, as opposed to 55 to 74. And I think also for particular high-risk groups, First Nation and Inuit Métis, as um, people who have had extensive childhood smoking experiences, you know, really should probably be enrolled earlier. Next slide. And so we need to have a way to, to deal with risk that is better than just age and how much you smoked. And so this PLCO, the PLCO model was really the best way that we have internationally to identify people. And we're able to, to do a better job um, at identifying people than just those traditional risk factors. Next slide. I know I'm going fast. So I, I, whenever people have questions, then don't hesitate to ask me or, or we can talk talk offline. Um, and really, you want to involve people that have about a 2% risk in six years of, of, of having lung cancer. And it's just a, a mathematical model on their family history and other risk factors like COPD um, above and beyond. And so I, I've embedded a, a risk calculator. Next slide. So the other issue is really smoking cessation. And so, you know, we know that, that a large portion of people um, are smokers that enroll in the program, but um, not the least of which, um, you know, gives us a good opportunity for people to quit smoking. Uh, having an opt-out strategy, which means that everybody who comes in is offered smoking smoking cessation, not just waiting for them to ask for help, uh, is important to have um, um, help in this, this domain and, and helps with the effectiveness of smoking, of uh, lung cancer screening. Next slide. You know, when we talk about radiology, next slide. Um, what we're really talking about is that that the scans themselves have to be consistent. What, what happens often if people get want to get a CT scan and they don't participate or don't have available to them a lung cancer screening program is they'll get a full dose CT scan, so much higher radiation and, and having iodinized contrast in their arteries and veins, and, and that's not necessary. And so one of the reasons that we argue for this to be broadly available is that if people get conventional CT scans, it actually does them a disservice. And so we want to make sure that the scans are done at the lowest possible radiation and of good quality. Next slide. And we also want to make sure that the radiologists themselves are good quality so that that we want expert radiologists who, who read this because this needs to be done in a structured manner so that we don't over scan people. Next slide. Um, and, and because one of the things that happens is you often find things by accident, whether that's thyroid nodules or coronary artery calcification, these things need to follow up and need to be, um, um, uh, I like uh, Denise's question. We can talk speak to that in a second. Uh, Denise, uh, uh, we find things by accident. We need to know how to manage them and not forget about them. Next, next slide. Um, so, you know, something like a quarter or half of people will turn out to have something found by accident. So you just want to make sure that that you know what you're defining. And in an Ontario setting, um, we've been very specific about about this so that people don't get a whole bunch of scans that that may they may or may not need. Next slide. So um, the last thing is diagnosis. So when you take when you so this will actually speak to the question that came out, which is you know this is very narrow in definition. I think that. Um, um uh how we how we involve and in, enroll people even with this very strict criteria you know you've smoked at least 20 pack years um we've risk assessed you only about two to three percent of the scans that we do are actually going to find lung cancer and so 98 to 97 percent of people don't have lung cancer which is great but there's a lot of anxiety for those people and we just want to make sure that we um are scanning a number of people to where we can provide benefit and obviously not scanning people um, unnecessarily Next slide. And so, you know, we really have to have that, that capacity. And so, you know, we really need to have the organizational capacity, you actually have to have the physical scanners. And that's one of the challenges in, in a lot of jurisdictions is actually having enough scanners for people to get onto, making sure you have enough radiologists to read them, nurses and, and doctors to manage patients, and then making sure that we have the data capture and the quality improvement to, to make sure we're doing a good job and not just um, doing this quickly, but, but doing it well as, as well. Next slide. And so this is a giant long list that I'm certainly not going to quiz anybody on. That, that sort of when we talk of, when I talk internationally about how to build a lung cancer screening program, you know, you really have to have all these pieces in place, and it takes about six months to a year for for even well-meaning, well-intentioned, hard-working people to to get this to land, and it takes a lot of a lot of people to build it. Next slide. And I think that that one can't help but speak to the importance of data and making sure that we capture that data. Up front, and that what we reported out to help others to improve, but also making sure that we're doing a good job. Next slide. 
And so, you know, I, I wanted to end this this talk with a bit of uh, where the where the future is going from here. Um, and so, uh, um, next slide. These are some of my thoughts. So, I thought that certainly artificial intelligence is revolutionizing this. That we do think that AI is going to take over the whole radiology portion at some point. Um, that, that those deep learning um, and machine learning will help us to automate this. That people's individual risk, and I think that speaks a bit to what Denise was asking, was there there are people with strong family histories or indoor air quality or other factors that we did, we don't even know of yet that we need to take into account to making sure that that we and, and not the least of which is that the highest increase in lung cancer is in non-smoking women. So clearly, the environmental exposures are going to and genetic exposures are going to be key. Um, and then and then how we do that, and 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 I think something that we can all speak to is really the whole stigma around this and making sure that people get the treatments they need um, and that we advocate for more funding for lung cancer. So thank you for participating today. I know that was a whole lot, but if anybody has any questions, then please don't hesitate to reach out. That was fantastic, Christian. Thanks so much for taking time and uh, and speaking to all of us. Um, I know this is a big elephant in the room and it's been a big elephant in the room uh, in Canada for quite some time. And honestly, I'm thrilled that we have someone like you to push this agenda forward because we not only need screening for the narrow band um, that have been studied, but we need to figure out how to generate evidence so that we can benefit the population as a whole. And I see you know, that came up in the, the questions and the comments and I, I know you're up to the task. So uh, thank you again for, for your time today. I'm going to move on to the next section uh, of our uh, lung cancer briefing. Um, and I know this is a favorite portion of many of our Lung Cancer Canada events. And this is where we've got a patient uh, panel discussion. So it's my honor to introduce two uh, of our lung cancer patients today. Uh, first, uh, Nina DeVito. Uh, Nita is uh, from St. Lazare in Quebec, uh, and she was diagnosed with uh, stage four uh, EGFR positive lung cancer back in 2021. Um, she loves spending time with her family, and maybe I'll let her tell us a little bit about them. Um, but uh, her claim to fame is that she has helped create the Canadian expansion of the Exxon 20 patient group, and she's actually the the, the uh, chair of the Quebec wing of the Exxon 20 patient group. So I love it that we've got a patient advocate uh, here. Um, next, uh, I'll introduce Donna Passy. Uh, Donna lives in Airdrie, Alberta. She was diagnosed with stage three adenocarcinoma of the lung, uh, actually just recently here in April of 2023. She's married and has two grown daughters and she's got a grandchild on the way. Um, and she has lots of uh, activities, loves to read, write, bake, and exercise. And she's actually writing, taking this opportunity to write her first book. Um, so welcome to Nina and Donna to our, our patient panel today. Um, maybe I'll start with uh, Nina. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, a bit about your lung cancer diagnosis journey? Sure. <clears throat> Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jurgens. Um, hi, Donna. <clears throat> so, um, as Dr. Uh, Jurgens mentioned, I'm Nina. I'm from St. Lazare in Quebec. Um, so I was like a lot of you, uh, someone that was healthy before. Uh, I'm a mom of three. I have three and a half grandchildren. Uh, and uh, was working very hard on a very uh, high-stress job, do, going about my things. And back in December, 2020, um, I started to experience back pain in the middle of my back. And I thought for sure, you know, being healthy and everything, I thought it was just something I had pulled or maybe, uh, you know, a sore muscle. And that really uh, coincided with uh, the beginning of the COVID crisis. And uh, at that time we had decided to work remotely. And I said to myself, it must be the ergonomics of my chair. It must be, you know, something wrong. And uh, I finally uh, contacted my GP to, to, to try to see her uh, at the time, uh, you know, the doctors weren't seeing the patients. Uh, they were mostly uh, talking, doing telehealth uh, uh, calls. And uh, because I was healthy before, we didn't think too much about it. She prescribed me some anti-inflammatories and uh, I went about my, you know, my life uh, taking the pills, but not feeling better. And in fact, it was just getting worse and worse. And um, so all this to say that I went from December to almost April in between trying different medications uh, um, and and even uh, doing some physiotherapy, um, osteopath uh, visits, 
And uh, at one point, I just woke up one day in April of 2021, uh, still during the pandemic, and I couldn't get out of the shower because I had back spasms that were really, really bad. So I ended up leaving my home uh, in an ambulance and going to the emergency ward by myself because my husband couldn't come uh, because of COVID. And I thought I had a herniated disc, to be frank, and I thought I'd be in and out of there. Uh, they would give me an injection or something, and I would be uh, better. But that's not what happened. So uh, I actually got there. They did a CT scan. And so they saw right away that I had a tumor in my in my right lung. I had zero symptoms of the lung. I didn't cough. I wasn't out of breath. I didn't lose weight. I didn't have all the other uh, different uh, symptoms of people. And I never smoked. And so um, the, the, the doctor came to see me and said, I don't have good news for you. Um, we, we saw that you have a tumor in your lung and it's spread, it's, it's gone to your bones and you actually have two pathological fractures of your vertebrae. And so I went like, you know, like alone uh, uh, on a stretcher, uh, I was given that information. It was horrible, horrible experience. First of all, I knew nothing about lung cancer. I thought it was a smoker's disease. I thought that stage four, because they told me it was all over the place. So they said for sure it's like stage four. I thought it was, I wasn't gonna come out of the hospital. So it was very, very devastating. So all this to say is that um, it's not the case. So, um, you know, you, you have to, to learn a lot. So I had to learn a lot about the disease. Um, I was able to return home, eventually get treated at the uh, Montreal uh, MUHC um, uh, Glen Pavilion in Montreal, where which is a very uh, nice hospital, university hospital with very knowledgeable people. And I was taken on by uh, great doctors. Um, right away, they gave me palliative care, um, radiation to my back to stop the spasms and get me at least some comfort. And uh, we went ahead and did the bronchoscopy. Again, I didn't know anything about next generation testing, but they did that. And uh, in between the time that I was diagnosed and they, the report came back, at first the doctor explained that it was probably one of the more common um, mutations that people have or, or, or in lung cancer, that it was probably going to take immunotherapy or maybe a very known medication, but that wasn't the case. It came back that I had what's called an EGFR exon 20 mutation, which is about 10% of the people who have EGFR mutations, so it's pretty rare. So not a lot of people have this. And unfortunately, this type of mutation doesn't usually respond very well to the traditional uh, or more common um, targeted therapies or immunotherapy and, and, and things like that. So I was given chemotherapy. And then again, you know, my reflex was, oh my God, I could see the hallmark uh, pictures where people are no hair, they're dying, they can't eat, they do having chemo. And I was devastated. I thought, you know, that's it for me. Uh, but it wasn't the case. So I was put on uh, what's called uh, carboplatin and permetric said to two uh, chemotherapies for four treatments to see how that would go. And um, after that, I would continue with permetric said if it, if it worked. Uh, that was a standard of care for my mutation at the time. Um, so what happened is that once I did the four first uh, um, chemos, that actually worked. It reduced some of the and controlled some of the uh, metastases that I had, and the tumor wasn't very big. Um, and so they proceeded also because my back was killing me, right? And I tried epidurals. I tried all kinds of medications. Um, we went ahead and did a spinal fusion surgery. So I went and, and really advocated for myself to get it done. And I was able to do it in between two chemo, chemos. And I had five vertebrae that were fused together with, uh, with screws and uh, metal rods. And I had bone cement injected in my back. And uh, it was COVID. And they let me go the following day of the surgery. So I went home with 64 staples in my back and uh, in pain, like you wouldn't believe it was my first surgery ever. But now two years later, and that was in September, 2021, I have to say for me, it was a game changer because I was slowly you know, starting to collapse and I wasn't able to support myself and I was in co continuous pain. So, but it was again, uh, 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 you know, I had to advocate for it and push for it. Cause again, people tend to associate stage four cancer or you have lung cancer, you're, there's no hope. Why, why go through the operation? So. If you feel like you can do it, then you can, you know, try to get it, get it. That's my my advice. 
Um, so after the uh, after this, I actually did uh, thir 34 maintenances after the four. So I did 38 chemotherapies over almost uh, treatments, almost over two years. Again, uh, with um, some radiation of different spots that flared up along the way, and including um, a radiation of my lung in July, um, which is still percolating, I think. And um, and so, uh, but I, unfortunately, I, I, I uh, had some progression um, elsewhere, and we decided that my oncology was time for me to move. So in parallel, I really educated myself, and I joined a Facebook group specifically for the Exxon 20 mutation, and I, I tried to see what was out there, because... A lot came out in the last two years. Um, a lot of it was in clinical trials, and I just needed to know what was out there and have a, a discussion with my, my doctor to see what do we do next. So I actually went and tried to get into a clinical trial in Toronto as a second line of treatment. Um, I had my hopes were up. I spent uh, maybe a, a month and a half back and forth driving the five hours in, five hours back, um, and gone and did all the tests over again and everything. Unfortunately, they discovered a small lesion on my cerebellum and they said, uh, you, you, can't, you have to have it treated. So they pulled the plug on me like a day before I was supposed to start the medication. Uh, so it's a bit discouraging. However, I had the experience. I know it's possible even for someone from Quebec to go to uh, Princess Margaret to get everything in order and try to get in. So it's very encouraging to see that, you know, if you if you go for it, you can. So there was nothing, unfortunately, uh, in my local uh, my local hospital or even in the region. And uh, now, because this didn't work, um, I got onto a program uh, with uh, the drug um, amivantamab or ribavant from Janssen. And it's a, an infusion again. I wanted to take a break from an infusion because I had so many. But you know what? It's, it was made for Exxon 20. It is uh, in the States. They seem to use it a lot. There's been some, some recent uh, uh, clinical trials to show that even they want to push it as a first line treatment combined with chemo. And at the time when I was diagnosed, it wasn't a clinical trial. And I used to be thrilled that something was coming out for Exxon 20. So now I'm actually on it. I uh, just started it um, and uh, we're crossing our fingers. We're going to address, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the, the lesion that they saw with, with the SRS uh, radiotherapy and crossing our fingers. So that's my story. Sorry, it's, uh, it's very long, but <laughs> still here after over, over two years. Thank you so much, Nina, for that uh, wonderful story of, uh, gosh, we could make you into a movie. Um, well, Donna, why don't you tell us a little bit about... Uh, about your journey? Oh, okay. Well, let's see. Uh, I got married June 2022, and I flew back. And about a month later, I thought I had a cold. I got a cough and everything. And I moved to Alberta from Ontario about a year before that. And I didn't have a doctor where I lived for about 15 years. I didn't have a doctor. And then when I moved here, obviously I didn't have a doctor at the time. So I realized I had gotten a sinus infection and I knew it was a sinus infection. Well, nobody was taking walk-ins. I couldn't get a doctor to take me, all this stuff. So finally I took a cab from this one doctor's office and I just walked in and I said to the receptionist, I have a sinus infection and I need medication now. And I don't have a doctor. I can't find one. What do you do? Can you help me? It turns out she suffered from sinus infection and snuck me in to see the doctor who said, okay, I'm going to take you as a patient. So that worked out there. So I got took the medicine and still this cough wouldn't go away. So I went back to see the doctor and she said, it's post-nasal drip or asthma or both. Here's an inhaler. Here's some nasal spray. Off you go. And I said, well, what if that's not what it is? Because this cough is, I've had it since June. So I got back. Whatever, that's all it is. Off you go. So I go away. Cough won't go away. Post nasal drip stuff. Yeah, whatever. But my dad had post nasal drip his whole life. Never had a cough. And I don't smoke. So who knew anything about that genetics? So I go back. Tell the doctor again. Yeah, this cough won't go away. There's got to be something wrong. And I said right to her. What if it's lung cancer? She just turned her back on me. Wrote me a different prescription. For a nasal spray, refilled my inhalers, and sent me on my way. So I took off with that stuff saying she just says, post nasal drip again, and maybe a bit of bronchitis. Whatever. 
that's it. So that went on for a long time. I'm using this stuff again. Nothing's going on. Nothing's changing the cough. Nothing's doing whatever. So finally, I go back in again. So she finally fills out an x-ray form for me to go and they see if there's something there for chronic cough. This is going on five five months. It was January by now. And she sends me for one of those uh, the, the breathing tests. A little, little clinic for that. So I go and get that done, get the x-ray. The x-ray place is like, oh, you better get a hold of your doctor. I think we know what the cause of your cough is. Mind you, it's an x-ray they can't really see. They just see a white blurry mass. That's it. They don't see anything else. So it took me a week and a half at, at least to get in to see the doctor again. The radio just recommended that I have a CT scan. Well, they put me on the non-urgent list. Not urgent. Put me on non-urgent. So about seven weeks later, I finally get in for the scan. Then I finally get to go see a, a respiratory specialist in there. So then they start doing all those other tests. But I mean, I already knew my sister's like back in Ontario. She goes, I think you got a piece of ghost though. My husband's like, I think you swallowed a bug. There's something stuck there. I'm going, I don't think so. I think it's going on. So finally they did the bronchoscopy and all that and found out it was lung cancer. And I mean, the amount of time it took me to actually get to meet my oncologist, because I had two at the time back then, one for radi one for the radiation that I was going to receive, and one for the one I'm seeing now, the main oncologist, my medical one. So it took uh, 11 months by the time I saw an oncologist, which I think is kind of long, and it should have been. So then he tells me it's stage three. I was told we're all case. Now you tell me I got stage three lung cancer. All this time that took just to get in to see them. And he says, you, you look, just by the looks of you, you got eight months left. Good thing you got here when you did. He said, any others might have already passed away or just had a few weeks left and we couldn't help them. So finally he got the ball rolling. I was so relieved to finally meet somebody who's going to help me. So he's still my doctor. I'm in, I did uh, two chemotherapy, uh, 30 rounds of radiation. They gave me a little break. And now I'm in immunotherapy. I've had three and I've got nine to go. So I'm feeling good, put some weight back on. I'm in the ACE exercise program, which is beyond wonderful. Uh, you know, like it's so things are going along. I'm going to be grandma in the spring and I'm not planning on going anywhere. So <laughs> that's where I'm at right now. Oh, congratulations, Donna. You've got the hardest part behind your uh, back now and hopefully onwards and upwards. Um, I think some of the things that I've heard from Nina and some of the things that I've heard from Donna really speak to some of the struggles of our lung cancer patients is that um, it's not a uniform playing field in this country. And um, Dr. Snow and I were at a meeting just this past weekend where we spent a fair bit of time talking about how each individual set of provinces deals with these things and how we struggle with how we provide best care to patients. Um, and I absolutely hear you, Donna, on some of your struggles for access to, to resources. It may actually surprise this audience that um, access to simple things like medications actually differs province by province. Um, so in some provinces, whether it's an intravenous cancer treatment or an oral cancer treatment, it's covered by your provincial government. In other places, if you have an intravenous treatment, it's covered by the provincial government. And if it's an oral treatment, it may only be covered if you're under a certain age, you're considered a child, or if you're an adult uh, over the age of 65. And if you're in between, I hope you have a private drug plan or a trust fund because um, otherwise you're in trouble. And it's very different from place to place. Um, and even going from province to province can seem daunting. Like Nina, I was very thrilled to hear your experience at being able to navigate getting back and forth um, from Quebec to, to Ontario and back. 
Um, cause I know that that can be one of the more daunting ones. Um, you know, I had just took a patient on who, who moved to my province from the Yukon. Um, and I was thrilled that one of the things that came in the pandemic is, is, um, for our cancer patients, there's no longer a waiting period for OHIP. So he was able to go straight in and provide, uh, apply for provincial coverage, um, immediately instead of waiting three months, uh, like, uh, we used to have to do back in the day. Um, so I, I think there's been a, a, a lot of big differences for 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 all of us uh, out there with how we interact with the healthcare system, and I think one of the things that I want to encourage folks is is we need groups like Lung Cancer Canada to keep us talking to to have us realize where these different gaps uh, come from, and the different provinces and to figure out how we can overcome them. And one bit of good news from the medical advisory committee uh, at Lung Cancer Canada is is we finally are getting a voice in Quebec. Um, so we have had a voice um, at the uh, health technology assessment table um, called CADETH for quite some time. And Lung Cancer Canada writes physician and patient letters that support uh, the new drug applications for all lung cancer indications. And we speak to uh, why a particular medication might be important for our lung cancer patients or a technology as it may be. Um, but there's a separate process in Quebec and they haven't had a mechanism by which patients and physicians can um, offer their, their thoughts. Um, and Lung Cancer Canada, our co-chair for the Medical Advisory Committee, Dr. Zhao, um, has actually negotiated getting our voice at that table. So we'll be the first um, program to be able to provide regular input into the INES review of drugs. Um, and we would love to see this be um, uh, a first step to trying to get uh, a, an even benchmark across the country. Um, so Nina and Donna, I really want to thank both of you for sharing your stories. Like I said, every time we have one of these events, that is the thing that we get the best feedback on is how heartwarming it is to hear people's stories and hear how they've come through adversity. And both of you um, are shining stars as to, as to how you guys have come through. So thank you for being brave and coming and speaking to us and, and being leaders in each of your own provinces. Well, we're coming to the end of our, our hour here today. Um, I would like to thank everyone for attending uh, the Spaces of Lung Cancer report briefing. Um, it is available uh, now on our website. And again, uh, we'll post uh, that uh, link in the chat. Um, the long awaited update of our comprehensive guide to lung cancer is coming soon. I know it's on my agenda to get my part read. Um, so we're going to be updating that. So that will be available in your uh, different oncology centers as well as on our website. Um, and we've gone to great efforts to have it available in uh, not only English and French, but uh, we're also working on as many uh, other language options. Uh, for example, we have Chinese as well. I'm trying to reach out to as many patients across the country as we can. I would like to thank all of the participants uh, in all of our, our different activities, all of the volunteers who, who donate countless hours to help our agenda, our board members for their dedication and their commitment to LCT throughout the year. And I'm looking forward to 2024. Um, we are actually getting even better uh, post pandemic. And I think uh, we really are, are bringing even more value add uh, to our patients and caregivers across the country. I would like to once again, thank all of our sponsors. Again, Roche Canada, Merck, Pfizer, Sanofi, AstraZeneca, EMD Serrano, Janssen, Gilead, Lilly, Bristol Myers Squibb and Bear. Um, without the support of our pharmaceutical partners, not only would we not have uh, new medications to bring to Bear, but we wouldn't have um, the ability to do all of the educational work and the support work that we do through Lung Cancer Canada. Um, so uh, I think uh, that covers all of our agenda today. I would once again like to thank our, our speakers today, both Dr. Stephanie Snow and Dr. Christian Finley. Uh, and once again, thanking Anina and Donna uh, for their heart moving stories and inspirational uh, stories. Um, this has been a, a wonderful bookend to Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, and thanks to everyone uh, for their hard work in, in bringing this uh, event uh, to production.